Hey, what's up, nerds? Paul Conti here, back with a bit of a tournament recap and an introduction to the battle reports to come from uh, the Triumph GT last weekend in New Jersey. Um, this is probably just about the last GT of uh, Age of Sigmar First Edition, so uh, went in with a Nurgle list with Plague and Touched Warband, and I uh, wanted to do a quick video going over, well, this might not be so quick, but going over the list, uh, general thoughts, performance, and um, you know, th some things that might change in future lists. Here is what I took. Um, took a great unclean one with uh, Doomsday Bell and Bioblade. He took a uh, Tome of a Thousand Poxes to give him plus one to cast and unbind. And his spell was Favored Poxes. Uh, Harbinger of Decay, he was my general, and he took Grandfather's Blessing. Festus the Leech Lord, and he took Blades of Putrefaction for his spell. Lord of Afflictions. Uh, with a Rust Fang, Gut Rot Spume, and then a unit of 10 Blight Kings and three units of five Blight Kings, the Plague Touch Warband Battalion, and 100 points of reinforcements, which included a Bailwind Vortex for Festus, alternatively a unit of three Nurglings, and a Beast of Nurgle. Um, I also wanted to have uh, the other two Heralds available that are 100 points. I just didn't have enough time to paint both of them, and I didn't end up with a situation where I really wanted either of them either. So uh, it kind of worked out. I painted the right things. So um, away we go. Uh, Plague Touch Warband in general. Um, it is very cheap. It brings this list to two drops, and you know, a lot of people run Plague Touched as a one-drop list. Controlling your drops and going before your opponent does is really super good. Uh, the lowering of the drops, even with two drops, I did not encounter any one-drop lists. I did not encounter any other two-drop lists. Uh, so I controlled priority on the first turn in all five games. Uh, which is really interesting. Um, I did not expect that to happen. I expected somebody else to be uh, aggressively outdropping, and it's I think very important for at least this version of this list to control that first turn. The minus one to hit that you get from the Plague Touch Warband is really effective. Um, and the general openness of the Plague Touch Warband lets you take pretty much whatever you want. And you don't have to make subpar unit choices. You can just pick any mortal Nurgle stuff to throw in there, as long as one of them is a hero. Um, I did not use the other buffs uh, for taking units in multiples of seven models. I didn't feel that given the list I was running that it was really going to be worth it, I would have to run like either a unit of 10 Blight Kings as 7 or a unit of 15 as 14. I didn't want to go as big as 15 and I felt like sacrificing 3 models to get a, a relatively small buff was definitely not you, worth it for Blight Kings. Other definite downside of this is everyone hates this list. Like, this is not a fun thing to play against, and I really kind of feel bad for playing it. Um, in 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 the future, I expect Plague Touch will be less competitive just because it's going to be more expensive. Uh, I, I can't see that a world where this does not get wildly jacked up in 2nd Edition, so... Um, Especially considering the new design direction they're taking with battalions being a component of your list rather than like this where it can basically just be your entire list in one drop. That seems to be a direction they're taking things away from. So I would expect my money is on Plague Touched being, I'm going to put it at 240 in the new General's Handbook. That's uh, what I'm betting on. Um 
just based on you know where we've been at before with points and with other battalions um, because it's really super good and I, I I love it and hate it at the same time it's very effective but I don't like the, the gameplay that it creates uh, I think it creates a lot of feel bad situations um, and it's just not fun like it's not a good opponent to play against and I didn't really like that aspect of it you know every time I my opponents you know rolled their attacks they kind of groaned that they were minus one um uh so overall performance on the artifacts command trait and spells that i took grandfather's blessing is surprisingly effective it seems relatively insignificant to be able to move just one spot up or back on the cycle of corruption. But the fact that it happens at the beginning of your hero phase allows you to have like multiple triggered effects if you position the wheel correctly. And I'm going to get more into the, the whole wheel positioning thing in a moment, but it's really powerful. Um, especially when you can do something like, you know, trigger all your units heal, then move the wheel back and do mortal wounds to a bunch of your opponent's units. Um, and then cast a spell and move the wheel to something else that's even more useful. You kind of get three effects in one turn. Uh, and it's a once per game thing, but that once per game is really powerful. <coughs> Excuse me. Um... The Rust Fang is powerful, but it was typically really only tagging like one or two units, maybe three units a game. I would say probably two on average. So I kind of question how useful it actually is. The problem that you run into is that the Lord of Afflictions is not that killy. So you really need to go in, tag something with a Rust Fang, and then have Blight Kings come in and kill it afterward, after it's been weakened further. Um, and I'm not sure, like, if that doesn't work out, then you've got your Lord of Afflictions stuck for multiple rounds of combat, and uh, not able to give out that minus one to other units. So it's kind of a problem, uh, mostly around... It, you know, him just not being that killy. Tome of a Thousand Poxes. I put it on the Great Unclean one. Um, I don't know why other people have not been doing this. And it seems super excessive to have Tome of a Thousand Poxes and the Bile Blade on a Great Unclean one at first glance. And then you realize that you're casting two spells at plus two and unbinding at plus two. Excuse me again, my throat is so dry right now. Uh, pushing through anyway, just for all of you. So, what did this get used for the most? Um, I think the biggest use was really... I always forget the name of the spell, but moving the wheel to what you want it to be. When you're casting that spell on a 5 instead of a 7... And you have Grandfather's Blessing at your disposal. You basically always get to have the wheel wherever you want it. Wherever you need it to be on any given turn. And that is really powerful. When you need that speed boost, you've got that speed boost. When you need to um, have some extra killing power, you have that extra killing power. When you need extra defense, you've got that extra defense. Um, and it allows you to set up shenanigans... For raining mortal wounds on your opponent, lets you set up to heal in the next turn. Um, all manner of things. It's everything on the wheel is useful, and the ability to put it on whatever you want it to be makes it really powerful. I have played with the cycle of corruption in Path to Glory. Uh, running lists that don't have wizards in them. And I didn't have uh, Grandfather's Blessing as my command trait. 
And let me tell you, the cycle of corruption is significantly less useful when you can't decide what it is. When it's just random and moving and advancing each turn, it's not that helpful. It's very helpful when it is a table of seven buffs that you get to pick from each turn. Uh, so I took favored poxes for the spell on the Great Unclean one. Also, that uh, worked in combination quite nicely with Tome of a Thousand Poxes as well. That ordinarily goes off on a seven, I believe. Um, so it, going off on a five instead is really powerful. I didn't actually use it that frequently, and it's mainly because it has a 14-inch casting range. So that's really unfortunate, but when it did get used, it basically just made a unit worthless. Um, minus one to hit, wound, and save. Um, for people that were not familiar with the Nurgle book, they were shocked that there was a spell that powerful and it just completely disables a unit like it, it makes it so that it does virtually no damage now remember this is combined with plague touched warband so apart from uh things attacking the great unclean one you know that unit is now minus two to hit and minus one to wound so you basically almost completely eliminate its a unit's offensive capabilities with this spell and it makes it minus one to save so your blight kings can go in and just chop them down really easily blades of putrefaction i took it on festus and i never cast it out of five games in a tournament was not cast once and i'm not sure what to do about that because the other spells uh, that Festus would have access to are not that good. The other Rotbringer and Mortal spells I don't think are that great. So I'm not sure what to do. Um, I'm also, well, as you'll see, thinking about dropping Festus altogether. Probably will. Uh, so again, the Great Unclean one. The Doomsday Bell is... I think the the Bell and the Bile Blade and the Tome of a Thousand Poxes, that combination of things just makes the great unclean one this like ridiculous buff wagon right he's making all everything near him run faster and he's got a huge pie plate base so the amount of area that that um you know seven inch radius outside of him is is enormous and i really i need to actually do the math hammer video at some point about you know the the radius like the the bubble effects and how the base size has a major effect on the total area that is impacted by that but needless to say great unclean one with giving everything around him plus three inches to move it makes all the difference in the world because it takes all of your blight kings which are four inch move basically but most things in this list move four inches and he makes them all move seven and then with the tome and the bio blade then you can move the the wheel to whatever you want whenever you want it and it you can very easily uh just go for plus two movement and now you've got blight kings moving nine inches and if they get near a feculent gnarl maw they can run in charge so they, in their plus one to run and plus one to charge so it's it makes your blight kings incredibly mobile it also lets you take your lord of affliction and just shoot him across the board uh and fly into things very early on in the game uh again the bell and bile blade together uh i'm sorry the tome and bile blade together just make all of your casting so much easier it, it it feels like you're playing zinch you know like you just get to cast all the spells and they all go off most of the time uh you know you almost never fail your spells uh his native spell to his war scroll plague wind is also really good and i think it's going to be comparatively even better in second edition because 
Arcane Bolt is getting powered down. So he's going to be a rare source of a uh, spell that does D3 mortal wounds. And it'll go off on a 5. Um, and in a lot of cases, he, when he was going into kind of like offense mode and he was positioned up further out in the middle of the table, it was like being able to cast two arcane bolts a turn. Um, doing 2d3 mortal wounds to something on spells that practically auto-cast is very, very powerful. Uh, it, it, it was really useful. It killed a lot of stuff. Um, the interesting thing with the Great Unclean one as well is that he's really resilient. And it seems to cause people to do one of two things. They either say, holy crap, I can't do anything about that. I don't want to get into combat with that thing because I'm going to be stuck in forever trying to kill it. Or, alternatively, they say, holy crap, I have to try and kill that thing. And then they get in combat with it. And they're stuck in combat forever. And then they get charged by Blight Kings and whatever it is they were charging with gets wiped out. So, it's interesting. He creates this odd situation of making your opponent make tough choices. Uh, and really the same thing was happening with uh, Gotrot Spume and his unit of 10 Blight Kings that I'll talk about momentarily. But it, this was really, really effective. And I, I really seriously question anybody that is running more offensive builds of the Great Unclean One. Because he is a powerhouse buff wagon. At 340 points, he is very reasonable. And he is incredibly durable. And he, surprisingly enough, can actually hold his own in combat. And, um, you know, despite not really having a ton of offensive output, uh, it's just enough that it can clear some things away. And his ability to reflect back mortal wounds... Uh, with his ward save on sixes is also very good. Like sometimes that just did more damage than uh, the actual uh, attacks themselves. So the Harbinger of Decay. This is an interesting one. Because he is the thing that's giving out a five up ward save to Blight Kings. And he's resistant to magic. He can ignore spells on a four up. Uh, he's really durable. On his own. He's got a, a four up save. He gives himself the five up ward save. He's got seven wounds. Um, so. It, it, he can withstand. Quite a bit. He really is terrible in combat. Um, and. It makes me question. Whether or not. He's worth it. Um, considering his points. He's 160 points. So he's the same cost as five more Blight Kings. Five more Blight Kings is a lot more damage output than the Harbinger of Decay does. And I wonder if he's really saving 21 wounds a game by, uh, like, with his ward save. I, I wonder if you can really justify it that way. And if it counterbalances with just having more Blight Kings. Um, with the extra killiness making up for that and preventing damage from happening. So it's an interesting thought. Um, he He's basically just another buff character. And he's not really doing a lot. He's not carrying an artifact. His command trait is not relevant to him being in any particular place. Um, so oddly enough, he might actually get dropped out. Um, a... a I have vacillated back and forth on it. I really like the ability to save mortal wounds. I really like the additional save. But, I don't know. Something in my gut says more, more Blight Kings is just better. Festus the Leech Lord. Um, so, basically all of his spells go off on sevens. And that's really unlikely. I've gone off, go, gone over casting in other videos. Um, feel free to, you know, go take a look at the video I did on 
uh, casting and charges, like the general 2d6 rolls, um, and why 7 is such a problem. It, it You only get it about 60% of the time. So, trying to cast Bailwind Vortex, that also goes off on a 7. So, only 60% of the time, 3 out of 5 times, are you going to successfully get the Bailwind Vortex. If you do, then suddenly he's more useful because it increases the range of his spells. And uh, it gives him that plus 1 to cast that really he needs to be effective and have a reasonable casting value on his spells. But in 2nd edition, Bailwind Vortex is completely changing and it's not going to give out a plus 1 to cast anymore and it's only going to increase range by 6 inches. So I think that even the notion of putting Festus on a Bailwind in the future is not even really a thing. And with where he's at right now even i think i would drop him out of the list because the with the bailwind he that's really the only way he's very useful and it makes him effectively cost 240 points and i he just does not do enough damage or do enough uh of anything really to justify that i think i successfully got off curse of the leper on something like once per game maybe twice now and then. Um, the short range is definitely a problem. I never cast Blades of Putrefaction, not a single time, not even like an attempted and failed time, like didn't even try it once because I was just never in a position where I felt like that was the best option. Um, and I think his, his MVP play of the game was actually a long range arcane bolt in three places of power to kill an enemy hero that was on one wound left uh, and knock it off an, of an objective, preventing my opponent from scoring, um, which is something that literally any wizard can do, and I'm really like not impressed by that. So um, I think Festus... I have had this like love-hate relationship with Festus. I really like the model. I like conceptually, theoretically, what he can do. But I think his casting values are just a problem, and uh, the range of his spells is a problem. So I think future lists are not going to include Festus. <coughs> Excuse me, once again, I apologize. Let me take a sip of water here. All right. Gut Rot Spume. Interestingly enough, he is like the MVP of the list in some ways, and in other ways he does absolutely nothing. So what he is really good for is taking a unit of 10 Blight Kings, putting them on the uh, Plague Fleet or whatever, and uh, you know deep striking them into your opponent's back lines uh, on your first turn. Uh, Blight Kings get plus one to charge, so... Deploying 9 inches away from your enemy turns into an 8-inch charge, which is not that unreasonable. And it happens often enough that it's fine. And when it doesn't happen, your opponent still has to deal with, holy shit, 10 Blight Kings just showed up right next to me. Um... And they know that if they do not address those Blight Kings, they are going to rip their face off next turn. So it, it's, it turns into a must-address situation for your opponent. <coughs> the interesting thing is that like Gutrod himself doesn't do anything. Um, he His attack profile is not that good. Um, I mean, it's not terrible, but... The fact that he does he himself does not have that plus one charge, he's then deep striking in uh, alongside these Blight Kings, and the Blight Kings typically will make the charge, and then he will fail, and then he's just kind of stuck there, and the Blight Kings end up being in the way from him ever actually doing anything. So it's more like you're paying for like a 140-point battalion that lets you deep strike a unit of 10 Blight Kings. Um... Still not a bad deal. Um, still definitely a... Uh, I would say almost like an auto-include. 
it, just for the sheer power of it. And it's when you think about what it's actually doing, it, you have to think about the scenarios that you're playing and the fact that so many of the scenarios are dependent on really putting a lot of pressure on your opponent's side of the board. And this puts a lot of pressure on your opponent's side of the board from the top of turn one. And it they have to deal with it or those Blight Kings are going to come in and they're just going to start killing stuff. And they're just going to slowly kill their way through your back lines and destroy everything. <coughs> um, there were very few occasions when the, the entire unit of 10 Blight Kings died that got dumped in with Gutrod Spume. Very few. Um, they're really powerful. They usually take out more than their weight and points. And frankly, there were at least two games where, like, my win was straight up because of this. Like, they, it's 140 points to get those Blight Kings back there seems expensive. Uh, but considering how powerful it is, like, it, it wins you games. Like, period. It wins you games. So, that's that. Got Rot Spume, probably the MVP. Lord of Afflictions. He's basically a Rust Fang delivery system, and I wonder if there's other good options for delivering the Rust Fang, and if delivering the Rust Fang is even really the thing we need to do. Um, I feel like I've kind of mentally gotten stuck on a couple of different artifacts, and... Maybe I need to relook at them. I mean, it, this has been like the combo that people have talked about since the book was released. And I don't know. I just feel like underwhelmed by how it actually performs. What's good is he's pretty durable. Um, but because he's carrying that Rust Fang around, um, once your opponent realizes how dangerous it is, they put everything they've got into killing him. Which, again, much like the Great Unclean one, it forces your opponent to make weird decisions and maybe stick their neck out in places that are going to let you take advantage of the situation. And if they target him with anything but shooting, you know, if they're going at him with combat, like, even if he goes down, they're, he's tagging him with the Rust Fang first and then Blight Kings can sweep in and mop up. Um, so, he's really unimpressive in combat for his price. So, I am really sort of reluctant on him. I I feel like he is replaceable. Um, I feel like there's other things that could serve the same function uh, and be serviceable. All right, so I've already talked about him a lot. The Putrid Blight Kings, a unit of 10, three units of five. I think that's a really good mix. It basically lets you go with the fives, like center, left, right, and then the 10 come into uh, your opponent's side of the board. Uh, with the speed buff off of the wheel and off of the doomsday bell and being able to run and charge at plus one with the feculent gnarl maw and just, you know, either running or charging, getting plus one uh, they're pretty quick. They get into combat when you need them to. They hit really hard. They're extremely durable. I mean, it, it's 21 wounds for on five models and uh, a uh, four-up save. Everything in this battalion is minus one to be hit in close combat and usually got at least two of these units in the radius of of the Harbinger of Decay, so they got a 5-up ward save as well. Um, and even when they do lose models, with their banner, their bravery 9. So these guys are just really, really hard to shift. Um, your opponent has to put a lot into them to really make a dent. And even when there's two or three of these guys left they're still putting out a really respectable amount of damage. And they are dirt cheap for how much they do. I mean, they're 160 points. I suspect they're going up in 2nd edition, but maybe not. Um, so, 
uh, with Bravery 9, they basically never fail Battleshock. I think I had, like, my unit of 10 maybe lose a couple of guys to Battleshock over the course of the tournament. Um, but it, it's... It's just not really a thing. It's not a thing they do. They can also heal themselves, which is very valuable. And being able to get healed by uh, Plague Wind is also really powerful. Um, these guys are just fantastic. Uh, their only real weakness is that they are low body count. Um, you know, this whole list was 30 models. And... Uh, I played against some opponents that ran 30 models in one unit. And when you're playing missions where you're trumping an objective with body count, then it's very challenging. So some other notes. Um, on summoning, uh, out of five games, I cast the Bailwind three times and then used my reserve points for Nurglings once and Beast of Nurgle once. Um, definitely glad that I didn't just strictly rely on that Bailwind Vortex because there were a couple of occasions where it just didn't matter. Um, and there was, in addition to that, one instance where I cast the Bailwind, got it off, Festus was hanging out up there, and then he lasted there a turn and got shot off by long strikes, which is like... Why? Like, why did I do that? I don't. I think he like got one spell off, and it wasn't even something terribly useful. Um, the other interesting downside to this list in general is that there is a lot of die rolls and a lot of bookkeeping. So, your blight kings are rolling three dice for each model that is in combat, and they. The hits explode on sixes, and they do d6 wounds, and then you have to add those in, and then roll the wound, and uh, they have that ward save from the Harbinger of Decay, and they have their virulent discharge healing, and the virulent discharge damage, and then you have the incubatch damage and healing, and... And this is just, like, on top of, like, all of the other rolling that you typically do in a game. It, I feel like you just roll dice, like, twice as much with this list as you typically would. So, it just takes up a lot of time. And I definitely had uh, issues with time in this tournament. And I think, you know, partly in the future, I might take that into consideration in list building as well. That, you know, when you're building for an event you have to keep in mind that you have a time limit on your rounds and you need to uh, be able to actually finish your games and if you can't you might be put in a bad position and uh you know end up uh you know maybe putting up a loss that could have been a win um because of you know just the positioning that you are in at the moment when time got called so what else have we got here? Overall performance, I went 3-2 and two with the list. Um, I had one game that I lost to a death opponent that timed out. And it basically timed out because we were running into very similar problems where we were just both rolling a tremendous number of dice. Um, we both, like, he had his death save uh, with deathless minions. I had my ward saves. He had a ton of attacks because he was running like grave guard and skeletons that were to doing tons of attacks um so you know it, it, i think i feel like the sheer amount of die rolls is what caused that game to time out and that sucks and i want to find ways to prevent that from happening in the future um i played three games versus stormcast out of five um i won two and lost one uh, the one that I lost to took fourth, I believe. Uh, it's hard to feel bad about a loss when your opponent goes on to do so well and was a super cool dude. Uh, battle reports on all of these coming up. Uh, my last game was against Deepkin, and oh boy, uh, are, do Deepkin have some weaknesses against this. <laughs> um, I don't think my opponent really saw this coming. Um 
I never got tabled. I came close one game to getting tabled. Um, I had only a couple of models left, but uh, I never got wiped out. Um, there's a definite weakness to shooting in this list. There's not really anything you can do about it. The battalion doesn't protect you from shooting. And, um, you know, if something is not in range of the Harbinger of Decay, then your stuff's just going to get shot at and things are going to die and it's bad. Uh, changes for second edition. I think the real core of this list that makes the thing tick is running a lot of Blight Kings, having that unit of 10 with Gut Rot Spume, and using the Great Unclean one to be a giant buff wagon to enable all the things that you really need. Um, as I mentioned before, I think Plague Touched is likely to go way up in points. Um, reinforcement points are going away and that whole thing is getting restructured. Um, we're going to get free summoning and we're going to be able to put a lot of uh, plague bearers on the board to make up for our body count issue with the Bite Blight Kings. Um, so that's really good. I think that overall is a positive. I think we're going to be ditching Fe Festus uh, he's pretty bad now, and I think he just gets worse in 2nd edition, uh, especially with the changes to the Bailwind Vortex and um, you know various other rules changes. The Great Unclean one gets way better because he, with the Tome of a Thousand Poxes in his Bile Blade, he's unbinding at plus 2 on at 30 inches, which is just like, it, just say no to magic, folks. That's what the Great Unclean one does, just say no to magic. Um he was an all-star for unbinding spells when needed. Um, although I did not have many opponents that uh, were running wizards because I played three Stormcast play opponents. But when he was able to, he did that very well. Um, I think Horticulous Slimex is going to be a staple in the future. I've got him sitting on my painting table right now. He's going to be my next up. Um, along with the Heralds, which I think are just going to get done because they're cool. Um, I'm not sure I'm ever going to play them. Um, and, uh, well, I have to finish up all of my Plague Bearers because they are going to be super essential. I don't know if I'm going to finish all of my Plague Bearers. I think I have like 80 or 90, but uh, I think at least like 30 or 40 of those guys... Um, is going to be necessary <laughs> uh, in the next edition. So, uh, some unresolved questions um, kind of going forward. I'm still undecided if the Har Harbinger of Decay is worth it. I don't know if it's better to just run more Blight Kings. I don't know if you really need all of those extra saves. Um, some of that might end up doing with like the metagame in the new edition if like mortal wounds are a bigger issue with all of the spells that are flying around then he would be a really solid go-to to protect you from mortal wounds otherwise he's just like an extra save and that extra save is going on guys that are super durable on their own so i don't know how necessary that really is the Lord of Afflictions is basically just a Rust Fang delivery system. So, I really wonder if there are other options which are good. His command ability also doesn't work unless he's your general in the new edition. So, there may be some other options to consider. I don't know if the Rust Fang is even necessary, uh, especially if you run Blight Cyst instead of the Plague Touched Warband, which I think is going to be the way to go in general. Um, I've been starting to toy around with those lists. Um, the metagame also seems to be shifting in a direction where um, banking on like one or two drops or even three drops is not really a thing, it seems. Uh, I haven't been seeing too many lists that um, are really relying on a low drop count to succeed. 
Um, and the winner of the GT was a mixed order list that had like a bazillion drops and never went first. So, I mean, um, I, I think it's really not necessary. And depending on the situation, I think it's, uh, you know, it might just be kind of a waste to be really gunning for going first. Um, but we will see. We will see. So, bunch of battle reports to come. Uh, I took 149 pictures. So I've got to get all of those spread out into PowerPoints and uh, record the battle reports. Those are on their way. But until then, I will see you all later.